now after more than a year of conflict in Ukraine. Just how long will the international community keep supporting Kyiv? Well, the Foreign Secretary is proving our mettle today as he makes more commitments at the G7 meeting in Japan. Well, it comes as there's huge concern over what China is planning for Taiwan. So joining us now is the Professor of US Politics at University College Dublin, Scott Lucas. Good morning, Scott. Really good to have you on the programme with us. So the messaging from James Cleverly is going to be quite clear today, isn't it? He's going to say we need to keep backing Ukraine for as long as it takes. Will the other G7 countries agree? Yes. Um, I think, you know, we have flutters from time to time about whether certain countries like France may sort of edge towards saying, look, we really need to have negotiations between Russia and Ukraine, uh, which would risk allowing Russia to continue to occupy part of Ukrainian territory. But I think by and large, uh, you've seen a firm resolve. Uh, consider, for example, that the United States has just issued another package of military aid to Ukraine, has now provided more than $30 billion in military aid. The UK, by the way, has committed more than 2.3 billion pounds. Uh, Japan has just announced a new package of humanitarian assistance and has announced more sanctions on uh, Russia. Canada has also announced more sanctions on Russia. Uh, Italy and Germany, and especially Germany, uh, have really toughened their lines in support of Ukraine in recent months, including the, uh, the delivery of battle tanks, which will take place through, uh, throughout this year towards Ukraine and could shift the situation uh, for Ukraine to regain more territory in forthcoming months. I mean, the issue is, though, it's not just about goodwill, is it? And it's not just about determination. It's about money. And that is a finite resource. Well, you know, I'm just going to put a point to you, and it's a personal one. And that is, you know, in World War II, um, you know, I don't think anybody said, look, we need to stop the war because it's costing us money. Uh, you have got the most serious conflict on European soil since 1945. And I know that people in many countries have sacrificed before it. We've seen uh, Russia's risk to food supplies. We've seen Russia's risk to energy supplies. Uh, we have seen the fact that we have our own economic challenges, which preceded the Ukrainian war. But at the end of the day, I think most people realize here in the UK and elsewhere, the people who face the biggest challenges, the people who face the biggest threat are those Ukrainians who have successfully resisted uh, that Russian invasion, but at a great cost of lives now for 14 months. Mm. I mean, the Ukrainian people is certainly be very grateful for this this ongoing support and this pledge to continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. But, Scott, this is a marked shift, isn't it, from the messaging coming from the G7 last year, where there was more pressure for Ukraine to, to agree to end the war, to enter into negotiations with Russia. What's changed in that time? Vladimir Putin hasn't changed, but it's the recognition of what Vladimir Putin's doing. In the first... Two months of the war, you know, we even had face-to-face -face talks between Ukrainian and Russian delegations uh, in, a, in the country of Belarus. Ukraine tabled a 15-page proposal at that point, and they agreed, for example, look, we'll talk about the future of Crimea. This is this area occupied by Russia since 2014, but we need to freeze the attacks. We need a ceasefire. Moscow ripped that up. They had no intention of negotiating on those lines, and instead what they did is they stepped up their attacks. You might remember last summer. You know, they, they obliterated cities like Mariupol, killing tens of thousands of civilians in that city alone. You know, and it was pretty evident to everyone, no, Vladimir Putin wasn't intent on negotiating. He was intent on conquering this country. And indeed, his ex-president, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, said last week that Ukraine should cease to exist. So that line hasn't changed. And I think it was that recognition. You know, there were some European countries that really said, look, can we avoid the bloodshed? Can we find an off-ramp for Vladimir Putin? You've just been talking about motorways. Vladimir Putin doesn't want an off-ramp. He wants to charge further ahead, even as he's now beginning to lose on the battlefield. Mm. And the role of China as well in all of this has, has probably brought about that change as well. Well, I, I think it's actually interesting what China's doing, because I know that there are other tensions between you know, the U.S. and Europe and China. You've been talking about Taiwan. But the fact is, is that China's been carrying, playing a balancing game. Uh, consider this. Xi Jinping went to... Uh, Moscow at the start of March. And Moscow was like, yeah, 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 we're going to get military assistance from the Chinese. And indeed, there was a U.S. intelligence report that the Chinese were considering this. The Chinese backed off. The Chinese are saying very loudly, we're not providing military assistance to Russia. 
they are emphasizing what they call their 12 point plan for political talks. And they have even said, we don't support this invasion. We don't support the reaction against the invasion because we don't want to ally with the US and with NATO, but we're not going to support, we're not going to go all in with Vladimir Putin. And here's why. Why do you go in with a Russia which could lose this conflict? Even if you give it military support, China wants to get economic and political advantage by looking like the good guy, by building relations with Africa, by building relations with Asia. And importantly, they want an investment deal with Europe, which has been stalled. So China's going to balance. They're going to stay right in the middle. You're not facing a Chinese-Russia axis, at least when it comes to Ukraine. OK, so if that's OK, and that's obviously, from the international perspective, extremely positive, sure. why then is China doing all this saber-rattling around Taiwan? Because China considers Taiwan to be its territory. You know, we're in the same situation we've been since 1949, uh, when you had the Communist Party took control in Beijing, but you had the, the nationalists that went to this island uh, of Taiwan to establish the government there. And periodically, we have flare-ups over Taiwan. We even came close to nuclear war over Taiwan in the 1950s. Fortunately, we're not at that point now. But what you're seeing here is China will continue to flex its muscle with those military drills. They'll continue to say, don't you dare make support Taiwanese independence. The red lines are still there. On the one yeah, hand, but, but Taiwan will not become independent. On the other hand, we're not looking at a Chinese military invasion right now. And again, here's why. The day that China tries to overrun Taiwan, it rips up a lot of its economic position with other countries in the world. And economics trumps, trumps military position right now. Yeah, and perhaps just as well. Um, Scott Lucas, really good to see you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, sir.